Welcome to this fourth uh, Robustly Beneficial podcast. Uh, today we're going to discuss uh, the, a paper by Google uh, that was published uh, in 2014-15. I'm not sure exactly of the date. Yeah. Uh, and it's called uh, Focusing on the Long Term is Good for Users and Business, uh, which is a very interesting uh, paper. I think it's quite unique in its, uh, in its uh, genre. Uh, because it, it tackles the problem of long term and, uh, and the impact uh, of, uh, of some modification of the algorithm on the users in the long term, uh, which, if you think about this, is very rare. Like usually, what we're doing when we're doing um, when we're testing algorithms is always like very short term. Like, you, for, like most of the time, is A/B testing. So uh, the basic idea of A/B testing uh, is that. Uh, when you go on a website, the website is going to randomly choose to show you a version A or version B of the website. And uh, if pe people uh, engage more with uh, the version A than with version B, yeah, eventually the, the website uh, learns. Uh, well, it's very basic learning, but it mm -hmm. learns that uh, one of them is more engaging and it chooses, uh, uh, for instance, uh, well, the one that has the most engagement uh, out of the two. But these tests are very short term because they just see the immediate reaction of people uh, when they are exposed to, to this kind of content. Exactly. So in the paper, they describe the, the whole methodology on how they, they made this change, they made this study. So the basic idea is to have two conditions. One uh, that's called control, that is the normal condition in which the software works, and one experimental condition, which is a change. For example, the experimental condition can be increasing the number of ads by 25% that uh, appear in a Google search. And uh, uh, an interesting point was that they, they see right away that over the short term, just uh, over a few days, increasing the number of ads increases also the revenue. Mm -hmm. But for these users, for which we increase the number of ads, after one, two, three months, we also see that the, the user changed and they, they start to click less and less on the ads. Mm -hmm. So over the long term, if we count the effect uh, over every day, we see that in the end, the revenue decreased. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's uh, really interesting. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, was striking to me uh, in this paper, so well, maybe we can discuss more of the results before going into other things. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing uh, about the result is like the study of how long does it take for people to get used to this kind of uh, new ad load, for instance. And uh, so if there are more ads, people eventually learn to ignore more, more of them. Yeah. But how long does it take to learn? And I would actually, uh, so I, I, I did not have the chance to be surprised because uh, well, I learned about this paper in a talk and the guy just said, well, look, it, it takes that much time for people to, to learn. But I, I think it's an interesting question, I thought maybe for people who are listening, like how long do you think it takes for people to learn to stop, to, to, to click less on ads whenever you have this uh, uh, change of algorithm where, after which there are many more ads? Mm. Um, so the result in the paper was that after three months, they expect to have measured only 65% of the learning effect. So we can think that um, after six months in total that people would have reached 95% of how much they learn yeah. to avoid the ads. Yeah. yeah, and that's a surprising amount of time. Like, you would think that, like, if you think about it, when you, like, whenever I see a website where there are too many ads, like, uh, like I stop clicking on them or I stop going on the website uh, maybe uh, right, right, quite quickly. Yeah. And I feel like this learning process should be fast. Like if I had to guess. Yeah, so maybe this, you have this impression because you, you compare things that are very different. Yeah. But here they, they, they make the measurement of a small change in, a, yeah. in Google search results. They, they, I don't know how much they increase the ads in the experiment, but I think it's not from one ad to 10 ads, but yeah, from yeah, yeah, average of three to average of 3.5 ads. Yeah, I, think maybe something yeah I guess in this case, it's harder to, to, to learn. But, but then it, like, it means that you learn subconsciously, right? And if it's yeah, exactly. like, this kind of change. A lot of this kind of thing is unconscious. And it's, it's, well, it's quite amazing that um, what the, the learning rate of the unconscious mind <laughs> is very slow. Like, uh, it, it, take it takes months to, to, to change the behavior because of the change of, of, the, uh, of what we're exposed to. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's uh, interesting. Um, 
and it raises all, all, all sorts of other questions, like what are the impacts of uh, a change of the, the algorithm that recommends the less conspiracy videos, for instance, on, on, on some user. Uh, and probably if you do A-B testing, you would not see that much, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you would see. You would see that uh, if you increase how many uh, conspiracy videos are in the feed, then people would click more on it. But uh, what we could observe over the, the long term is that uh, if you sustain this increased amount of uh, conspiracy video, then maybe what could happen in the future is that users get uh, more critical and uh, decide to click to detect this kind of video and click less on it. Or what could also happen, which would be a, a lot worse, is mm -hmm. that users get to believe more and more in these kind of videos because uh, there also have been studies where we know that if you just repeat something to someone uh, a high num large number of times, they would start to believe it's true even though they had no reason to. So maybe over the long term, high increasing the number of conspiracy videos would make people believe in it more and engage with it uh, more and more. Yeah, yeah. it's hard, hard to, to study. Uh, one thing that was interesting in, in, the, in the paper is that they proposed the uh, new methodologies to, the, to study these uh, long-term uh, mm -hmm. effects. Uh, and, and maybe before get, getting into this, like it, it's interesting to know that it's it's hard. Like, uh, like we don't have a lot of studies in psychology out there, to the best of my knowledge, that study this sort of long long term uh, impacts of repeated exposure. I, even though like this kind of well, this paper really shows that there's a, such a, an, an impactful uh, thing going on after weeks and weeks and even months and months. Uh, and so, well, the, the methodology was well, was not like. Uh, I, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't say it was groundbreaking, but it's also it's still interesting. Yeah. Um, so the the way they did this is uh, um, well, essentially because like, the, the problem is that you you would want to well, the, the basic the, the basic approach where you have this user and you give it give him a treatment like basically uh, showing him more ads, for instance, for a long period, and then after that, uh, well, you need to compare this with the control group, and you need to compare this on the same kind of uh, exposure to the same thing. So the idea is that after this, you, you revert back to the old, uh, um, to the old algorithm, uh, the old uh, ad load, and you yeah. compare on, on this uh, same ad load, so small ad load, whether like the user who has gone through this uh, treatment period for, for weeks uh, is going to click more ads than uh, someone in the control group. And, and I guess this is like more like the classical uh, scientific method, uh, like the statistical test applied to this setting. But it's actually very inefficient because uh, you have to, to choose ahead of time the period uh, of time you want to study. And, exactly. um, yeah, and you don't know how long it will be. And then if you want to, to test more, but well, you need to, to redo the experiment with other people. Uh, and so the other thing that they proposed was uh, rather to do uh, this uh, this comparison between someone who has this change of algorithm for a long period of time uh, compared to someone randomly, uh, randomly selected from the uh, well, group of people randomly selected from the control group yeah. who are exposed to uh, increased uh, ad load on a given day only. Mm -hmm. And you compare uh, this. And this gives you, uh, well, this allows to give you a curve uh, uh, as a function of time and to see uh, if people. Uh, like to, to have this comparison over, over time, which is, uh, well, it is nice. <laughs> yeah, so the, the way they do it is every day of the experiment, uh, they would take someone that has not been in the experimental condition and just for this day, put them in the experimental condition and compare this with people that have been in the experimental condition since the beginning of the experiment. So like this, they, the, the short term effect is the same for the group used as control and the group used as experimental because they, they are both today affected by the experimental condition. But the, like this, they, are, they can measure how much the people from the experimental condition have learned since yeah. the beginning of the experiment. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, you think, do, you, do you think there's a better way to do this? Like I've tried to think of it a bit, but I haven't found a better way to do this. It sounds like a reasonable methodology. Yeah, I think so, because uh, the problem, as you said, that uh, either waiting for the end of the experiment to be able to make a measure, it's uh, very cumbersome, or during the experiment, if we only have experimental group and control group, the comparison is meaningless because we are comparing two different things. 
So yeah. the measure we get out of it is not interesting. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And w one reason why you you had to you, you well, they, they they said you that it was better to do this one day experiment like every day. Mm -hmm. like you, you could think that I'm just going to do this on the first day and that's the baseline, right? Uh, like I always compare how much people click uh, to uh, how much would, would click on the first day where they were exposed to more ads. Okay. But uh, by doing this repeatedly, like they, they can control for um, uh, confounding variables, uh, maybe um, like because of some other sites that people started using, they got to they, they learned on this other website to use uh, less ads, to, to click less on ads. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way to control for this, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or any uh, real life event outside of the platform can uh, change a lot for one for a few specific days uh, how much people engage with the ads like i guess if there is a political campaign people would be more likely to click on ads because yeah. people are talking about it at the moment so yeah this this is why they it was important for them to compare every single day with another group of this yeah. the same day mm -hmm. yeah um but i guess it does not completely remove the confounding variables uh because maybe they are um uh, well, as, as you said, maybe you get into a political campaign and there are like the ads are more, more engaging or like people are, are, are click more on ads. Uh, and this increases maybe the variance of, of how people click and maybe uh, the difference between the control group and the experimental group gets increased because of this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like yeah, so they, yeah, they agree. Uh, they, the measurements are very noisy, but uh, yeah. because they are also able to do it over a large number of people, then yeah. That makes it, uh, yeah, the impacts are quite high, uh, much larger than in the previous, like uh, the, the paper we talked about last week. Uh, like it was, I uh, don't remember the figures, but it was like double digits, like it was 18%, something like this. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, so 18% for, for Google in terms of uh, ad clicks, uh, it's a lot of money <laughs> when you think about it. It's like uh, billions of dollars. <laughs> so a uh, huge stake. Mm -hmm. um, and if you uh, want to do good, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think that it raises a lot of questions. Uh, it shows also really the impact or gain of the algorithms. Like here, you have very really huge impacts on how people behave on a daily basis, like how much they are going to click on ads, um, which is not what we perhaps care the most about here on the on this uh, on this uh, podcast, but. It's interesting that you see that just this change of very simple change, like you just add more or, or less ads, you, you, you change the, the people's behavior quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, algorithms matter. <laughs> they have a strong impact. Um, yeah, so as we discussed yesterday, that uh, the topic of ads is not extremely important and interesting. But uh, what was really interesting in that paper is that it shows that user learn from the platforms yeah. and uh, and these platforms have uh, an effect that can accumulate over the long time and, and change user in a very significant ways so certainly the, what we are exposed exposed to every day with this platform such as uh, polarization or, or angry videos they yeah. they certainly have a, in, an impact on us and that that make us learn and change our behavior yeah so this is a I think quite a uh, worrisome and uh, more studies on this kind of thing would be extremely uh, beneficial I believe. Yeah. Another striking thing about the paper is that um, the experiments uh, started uh, I think it was in 2007 something like this and mm -hmm. it was published in 2015 or something like this. Uh, so uh, like the, the the paper is the result of of, uh, of nearly well, maybe not a decade but like uh, several years uh, like say at least 5 years of studies. Uh, and, and this shows that it, it takes a lot of time to, to gather this kind of data uh, that are, I think, really interesting. And that uh, so, if you want to do robustly beneficial algorithms, I, I think it's critical to understand this interaction between algorithms and, and humans. And it takes a lot of time. So, um, like we should start now. <laughs> it's actually, yeah. Like we don't want to wait like uh, for the next uh, Cambridge Analytica plus 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 uh, because um, like it, I think there's a lot of things going on on the social media that we really don't understand, uh, and it takes years to understand them. Uh, it takes also a lot of resources like uh, like the 
Like you had to be Google to do this uh, essentially. Yeah, exactly. This this kind of study will very difficultly come out of uh, academic research yeah. because usually academic research is run by PhD students that yeah. do PhD for at most four, five, six years. And you don't do a five year study if you do a five year <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't exactly. start your PhD by saying, "Oh, I'm going to <coughs> run a five-year experiment." No, that's not, you're not going to graduate. <laughs> so yeah, the, do you think that uh, so there is this kind of experiment that can be run, but uh, simply analyzing the data from the past, even though there were no experimental conditions, can it give us uh, as much information as this kind of experiment? Yeah. So um, I think they they call like. Uh, there's a term for this, I think it was called like natural experiment or something like this, like when you s s have this population and for some reason one part of the population was exposed to this kind of, of content mm -hmm. and it was a bit arbitrary, like it could have been the other. Yeah, okay. Like in such a case, like you have a natural setting to do sort of a comparison between a treatment and a control group. Yeah. Uh, but this only occurs uh, like yeah, like usually there are confounding variables. Like the the reason why this group of people were more exposed to this kind of treatment was because of some other reasons, and maybe this other reason was the reason why uh, the treatment worked or something like yeah, this. Yeah, so we believe that the the data so far from the past on this platform is uh, nearly, nearly useless to answer uh, very no, deep research questions. No, I don't think it's useless at all. Uh, I just think it's uh, like very hard. To, it's much harder to analyze. But uh, there are, it's much more plentiful, like there are many more data like yeah. this. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can leverage maybe this amount of data. Uh, but if you are to do this, like you need to do it well. Um, and uh, like basically the classical approach of uh, test hypothesis uh, seems very obsolete to me uh, for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. um, yeah, yeah. I think I think he, 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 yeah, he, like to to study things that go that go on for for years like this, uh, where you have plenty of confounding variables. Uh, I think the the and given that there are lots of data and you want to, to explore this data to understand the, what's going on, um, I would say that it's uh, it's it would be worthwhile to have like more embracing like more global model more, more uh, models that can that include. Uh, different aspects like uh, uh, like uh, the fact that there was this president that got elected at this moment and, and things like this um, and it's going to be tricky it's going to be hard and uh, it's going to be not fully reliable mm -hmm. but maybe you can still leverage this by huge amounts of data uh, to, to, to have a model that still make predictions that are somewhat uh, uh, informative mm -hmm. uh, but yeah I think it's very hard and um, okay. Yeah, I think it it can have a, still a lot of value if you study population that are somehow homogeneous, and uh, you see that between them some got exposed somehow randomly to such type of content, and see how their behavior changed. Like uh, I don't know if you start watching a first video about football, then. Uh, there is a chance you will start to like football a lot and then change little by little to watch a lot more videos about football in the future. Yeah. I think this data, even though it would be subject to confounding variables, it could still uh, give us a lot of insight. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's extremely challenging to... Uh, because I would like encourage this kind of research. I think there's not enough of this kind of research. Like analyzing the past data, uh, data of uh, social networks, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but the study has to be done uh, extremely well, which is very challenging, and uh, and you need a lot of uh, of, uh, of very able people to do this. And also, like you need a venue to publish uh, your paper. And I, I'm not sure it's going to be that easy <laughs> to to publish this kind of long-term uh, quantitative studies of something with some very complex model. Like, I don't know if it's a field of research that exists today. No, I, don't, I don't, don't think so. <laughs> so, yeah, like, it, like it'd be hard for me to advise a PhD student to, to work on this. <laughs> like, I feel like it would be uh, a, a curious suicide. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. If you could do an experiment on, a, on let's say, YouTube, 
so decide to change something in the recommender system for half of the world and uh, observe the effect over time, which, what kind of things uh, would you do? Um, so so one, one, I guess one thing that I'm... So I've gotten more and more uh, interested in the, uh, the concept of uh, intellectual honesty. Um, like you know, Julia Gelef has uh, has a talk about this on, on YouTube, and uh, so so it's basically the idea that you should not you should try to not lie to yourself, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you think about it, we're lying to ourselves a lot, like uh, well, arguably all the time. Like we uh, want to believe something, and so we discard this thing, and we say, oh no, it's it's fine, and we tell it to ourselves, and uh, because of this, we have this confirmation bias going on. And all sorts of things uh, like this, um, and uh, like the, the, the example I gave once is that uh, when I was uh, doing um, math popularization uh, a lot, well, I'm still doing the, uh, this a lot, but uh, like I, I convinced myself that mathematics was extremely important. Like, and mathematics research is uh, under uh, uh, funded. Uh, now I. I, 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 I I'm not even sure about this anymore. <laughs> like, I don't want to make uh, mathematicians angry uh, <laughs> if they watch this video, but I think there are greater concerns like, uh, um, like uh, the uh, AI ethics. Uh, and, but back then, like, I, I think I was really lying to myself. So, like, because I was doing this mouth outreach uh, on YouTube and, and blogs, mm -hmm. um, like, I felt like I had the duty to defend mathematics. And I was kind of lying to myself. Well, mathematics is extremely important. That's why I'm doing this, and that's why you should also read me and uh, watch my videos and uh, fund me if you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I think intellectual honesty is really, really important. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, and I would like to have a better understanding of how different videos impact people's ability to be intellectually honest. Uh, and I fear that a lot of science popularization videos, uh, I I including mine, and that's <laughs> uh, very annoying for me, but uh, I'm trying to be intellectually honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think a lot of videos may be counterproductive uh, in this regard. Um, it's like comforting people's belief that science is important and is the way to go and what science says is true. and uh, and. It increased some overconfidence, and um, yeah. The, the, so I, I would be really curious to see the impact, uh, the, to try to analyze the impact of different videos on uh, uh, on people's intellectual honesty, uh, because I think this is really like something. If you can make progress on, it's going to be much easier after that to, to have more robustly the beneficial proposals for for algorithms or for societies. Uh, yeah, but this is a very difficult. Uh, <laughs> Like we talked about it yesterday about the fact that uh, mm -hmm. like you, you're doing uh, your PhD in uh, education uh, and uh, it's hard to study long-term effects in your field as well, even though it's critical. Uh, yeah. 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 So a lot of the experiments in psychology too, these days are like one shot. Like it's like you, you, you get this guy for two hours and you can do uh, not everything you want on the guy, but you can do things on the guy for two hours, but then like, it's over, like, you cannot touch the guy anymore. <laughs> I'm saying weird things, but... Uh, and uh, as a result, you only study a short-term uh, effect. Mostly, yeah. uh, and then you, make, uh, you write books and you make proposals based on this study of, of short-term uh, effects, and the long-term effects may be neglected. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, one aspect of the paper, nevertheless, uh, they, so they, 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 they build this model to, to anticipate the revenue of uh, Google based on a uh, number of users times how many ads we show to each other times how many users click, how much users clicks on ads times how much money we get from each ad. So they, what was interesting is that they had all these factors that is more than just how many clicks on ads do we get. A short term study would simply change the experimental condition and measure how, many, how much clicks on ads do we get. But this one, it it measure, measured over time these uh, several aspects. So what's interesting, what changed that the, the click-through rate, how much user clicks on ads, it changed over time. Uh, right as, at the beginning of the experimental study, it, will, it was uh, some values that was increased because more ads were shown, but then it decreased over time. So they, they see this as a more complex system. Um, something else that could happen is increasing the ads would decrease the number of users because users would yeah. 
in the paper they talk about the fact that they they try to anticipate what would be the long-term effect based on the short-term effect. Yeah. And uh, this can be valuable. I mean, uh, apparently it has been valuable for how they run experiment inside Google to to correctly maximize their revenue over time. Yeah. To not correctly, but better maximize their revenue over time. By now, they they sort of built a kind of indicator that you can test over a short period of time and will help you predict over a long uh, what would be the expected revenue for a longer period of time. Yeah, yeah. So they had this um, basic model where. Uh, as you uh, as you get exposed to something, you change your behavior, and then it adds asymptotes like this. Yeah. And the 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 typical time length uh, that uh, of variation is about uh, two months, uh, two or three months. Mm -hmm. um, and so this means that you can uh, you can apply this, for instance, to last week's paper. Last week's paper, like we we said that uh, uh, what the paper said that uh, if you change the algorithm. Of, of uh, Facebook news feed, you can change people's uh, what, what people uh, like how happy the posts of people who were going to be afterwards. Yeah. But the impact was very small; was the order of the one percent or two percent. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did some rough calculations. If you assume that uh, how people change their, their mood essentially is uh, similar to how they change their uh, clicking patterns on ads, uh, then you should multiply essentially uh, like roughly by twelve something like this. Um, it's also very, uh, well, it's very rough, but uh, mm -hmm. yes, by 12, maybe more. Uh, and, and this makes uh, the impact very important. <laughs> like you, you yeah, increase happiness by uh, 12, 20 uh, percent on, on yeah, billions of users. That's of huge. <laughs> that, that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also, like you, you can have uh, other side effects like for the, uh, like they, they, there are studies that show when people feel more lonely, they feel they, are, they, they become also more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So if people start to post more happier uh, posts, uh, then there can be a feedback loop. Like and people get more people get used to see even more uh, positive uh, content, and uh, like yeah, maybe there are some feedback loops that are not even captured by this uh, by this uh, toy model. Yes, um, very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but then there are also limitations to these uh, these predictions of the long term given uh, short term data. Uh, like maybe if there are some uh, some some features of human uh, cognition that don't that aren't uh, monotonic. Like maybe uh, at some point, like you you you, you get you too much exposed to this kind of thing and it's negative. Uh, like maybe you have more complex behaviors. Um, so. Uh, yeah, but we like data to <laughs> to understand really what's what's. Uh... Yeah, and there are even some things that uh, would be extremely difficult to measure within an experiment. So, for example, in the case of Facebook, if we do the same experiment and you talk about these feedback loops, that the more people post positive things, the more they will see positive things. But to really change, to really activate this feedback loop, you need uh, the whole Facebook uh, user base, yeah, or at least the all the network of of all of one huge network of friends that are all chatting together and see the message of each other to mm -hmm. to be connected to really activate this feedback loop. As long as you keep it an experiment with just 10% uh, of Facebook users, yeah. you, you, not going to see it. you will not see this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I was interviewed by uh, some other person uh, yesterday, and he asked me, um, like, if I get to choose uh, for the YouTube algorithm uh, whether it's going to like I, I could nudge, change it to so that it would uh, instantly promote a lot more ecology videos. Would I do this? Would I uh, click on the button like to, to do this? Mm -hmm. And um, and well, I answered like like I, it seems beneficial, but I, I, like I would be like I need more data to be really yeah. sure. Uh, and the, the like the typical thing that I am afraid of is that. Uh, if you just increase this, well, some of the ecology videos, well, the, well, there are videos like let's say that we should protect the environment and so on, but they are not really scientific and they may propagate fake news uh, or ideas that are actually counter counterproductive to to protecting the environment. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually a very complicated topic, uh, and there are lots of things that. Uh, 
well, like we gave the example of nuclear energy and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, ecological uh, like videos, like for instance, Greenpeace videos or stuff like this, uh, will say that, uh, um, that nuclear energy is, uh, is having a negative impact on the environment, for instance. Uh, and some, peop some people understand that, it has, uh, that this is because it has some uh, carbon uh, emission uh, and, and, and that's wrong. Like, and so that it's possible that just by clicking on this button, you, you're promoting the wrong kind of, video, mm -hmm. of videos. And it's also possible that by clicking on this video, you also create the wrong kind of reactions. Like, uh, so there was, there's this other paper, uh, probably we'll, we'll discuss it uh, at some point uh, on the podcast, that shows that if you uh, increase people's exposure to uh, alternative, view, alternative views, so, the, so the, the, the setting exactly was like you were on Twitter and you pay people to, to follow one Twitter account that retweets uh, message, like the, the, the tweets from the opposite side. Uh, if you're a Democrat, it shows you uh, uh, tweets from, uh, from Trump or I don't know who. And if you're a Republican, it shows you uh, Clinton or, or, or whatever. And they actually showed that this increased polarization. Yeah, well, they expected it to decrease the yeah. polarization, but it actually increased. Yeah. And, and that's a very, um, like, I've actually heard a lot of people saying uh, that uh, we need to increase diversity in recommendations of, of Twitter and YouTube and so on. Uh, well, actually, if you just do this, it's probably not going to be robustly beneficial. And actually, maybe, like, this study shows that at least for some people, it's going to increase polarization. Um, and so you, you really need to understand better these kinds of, of social medias and the psychology of people if you want to make robustly beneficial interventions. And that's why these kinds of papers, I think, are really like, important uh, and, and, uh, and really critical, I'd say. Uh, like you, you need more of this kind of paper, I'd say. Showing one a ecological video might convince, teach, teach something about uh, the ecology, but we should look uh, beyond that. How will user change uh, yeah. their behavior and what will they do uh, afterward? Yeah. After yeah. Some... Yeah, and it's also possible, like, if you want to do something that really robustly beneficial, I think the, the, what you recommend really needs to depend on the user. Um, mm -hmm. Like, if you want to get people excited about mathematics, uh, like, if, I love 3 one one videos, and, like, I would want the YouTube recommender system to just suggest the 3 one one videos to me. But maybe it's not the right kind of video for uh, 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 like a twelve-year-old uh, kid. Like, uh, maybe it's like it's going to scare him uh, because it's a bit technical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, same thing for, for for ecology. Like maybe there are some ideas of ecology that are scientifically correct and are really the way to go, but. Like the user is not there yet, and he needs to, to process all the information before getting to this kind of content. So, uh, like personalization at some point uh, is critical if you want to make, to make uh, robustly beneficial recommendations. Yeah, yeah and unfortunately, all of this is uh, very hard to, to study uh, and to analyze them. So, what can be done about uh, what kind of research can be done <laughs> to, to better understand the, the, these effects? Um, yeah, so, so uh, like the, the classical approach for studying long-term effects in, in, uh, in healthcare is epidemiology, where you just track people and you ask uh, through, through, through questions that you ask them, ask them through surveys, you ask them what they ate and stuff like this. But this is, um, but I guess uh, a survey about, well, I, I guess you could do epidemiology of, how people think. I don't know how effective it would be, how reliable it would be, um, trying to understand why okay. people change their minds about this or that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of research ideas that could be relevant to better understand how to make robustly beneficial algorithms. Um, yeah, clearly it's, it's, it's not easy. Maybe uh, some psychologists uh, that watch these videos or will have better ideas than, than we can. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. I think it's a lot of food for thoughts because it's quite uh, different from the way uh, people think about uh, algorithm te testing, for instance. Like usually you think of algorithm testing as you run this test and it's, uh, and it's done. But this kind of paper shows that uh, 
uh, well, tests are, are limited, have they, have, have they have their flaws as well. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think we need a lot more research to understand this. I hope uh, you found it interesting and uh, it's a lot of food for thought. And uh, I hope we will see you next time. Uh, next time we'll discuss uh, uh, the introduction of a PhD uh, thesis that was written here at TPFL by Luca Mestre, Mestre uh, called Efficient Learning uh, Through Comparisons, or from Comparisons, something like this, uh, which is also a very important thing in terms of uh, AI ethics because uh, if you know what people really desire, well, it's easier to know what's robustly beneficial to do. See you next time.